Let's talk about women in different career fields. Now, I have a lot of statistics, probably about 30 minutes worth, and I have less than 20 minutes to give this talk, so get ready. Just kidding. I do have some statistics, though, and we will get through them quickly, but they're important, so please stick with me. Women comprise 47% of the total workforce. Now let's look at STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Women make up just 28% of the STEM workforce. Within STEM, the percentage of women in different fields varies widely. Engineering has only 15% women, whereas biological sciences has 48. There are many other careers where women are even less represented than in STEM. For example, military officers, 18%. Aircraft pilots, 8 and firefighters are only 3% female. I'm highlighting these fields because I served for 20 years as a uniformed officer. For 15 of those years, I was a pilot. I have a master's of engineering degree, and I served as a volunteer firefighter. Currently, I am a leader at a major marine biological institution in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. I have over 20 years of experience as a female professional in fields where I've been a minority. Before I go on, I want to share just a little bit more about my background. I have a marine biology undergraduate degree. I've spent my career working on research ships and research aircraft, frequently in a command role, conducting scientific research from the equator to the Arctic. For my undergraduate field work to my current executive leadership role, my career has been rewarding, but it has not been easy. Women have come a long way, and there is more work to do, which I'm going to talk about. But I want to start off by saying that it is 100% possible for women to be successful in these fields. If I can do it, you can do it. So let's dig in. I'm going to talk about how we retain women in STEM. But before I do, it is appropriate to pause here and acknowledge that 48% of biological science is made up by working professional females. I love where I work now because I work with more women than I've ever worked with in my career. I feel more supported here than I ever have. So I want to acknowledge that this statistic is good. You can look at it and say, we're done. But this number masks the challenges that exist for women in the sciences. For instance, this number looks significantly worse for women who are minorities. Within STEM, only 6% of women are African American, and only 6% are Hispanic. In addition, there's still a significant discrepancy between women in the biological science and women in leadership positions in biological science only 13 to 24%. We call this attrition of women a leaky pipeline. And I'm not talking about Deepwater Horizon. I'm talking about the professional pipeline. Leaky pipelines exist throughout STEM. Women drop out of the field more frequently than men at all levels. Women and men start out at roughly even distributions as undergraduates, so 50% female. But the number of women who actually end up employed in STEM is 28%. What contributes to this? For many scientists, field work is a necessary part of the job. Field work is frequently conducted by small teams in remote locations for extended periods of time. Women experience more hostility, sexual harassment, and sexual assault in these environments and often there is no way for them to get out. Jerrica Hines of the Fieldwork Initiative found that over two-thirds of the 50 researchers she interviewed experienced violent, harassing, or fear-inducing events while conducting fieldwork. I personally experienced this, conducting fieldwork in New Zealand as an undergraduate. This work required being dropped off on remote islands where we worked together for days at a time with no break. 
The male leading the research was hostile, demanding, and treated women inequitably. There was no way for me to get off the island or even to communicate with the outside world. Ultimately, I stuck it out, but it made me question my future in field work. Many women have similar or worse stories, and this is a leak in the pipeline. Another aspect of field work that disproportionately affects women is its extended nature. It is not uncommon for field work to require being away from home for months at a time. It can be harder for women to commit to this than men. A woman in a relationship may have to navigate the trade-offs between doing what's best for her career or her partner's. Additionally, women who find themselves in parental or caregiver roles may find it much more difficult to navigate an extended absence for work. On that note, it's harder in general for women to have successful careers due to the challenges of work-life balance that arise from becoming a parent. This is another critical junction in many, many women's careers and a place where many women leave the workforce. The Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that for parents with children under the age of three, less than 64% of women work and greater than 95% of men work. Discrimination based on pregnancy is considered sex discrimination and is illegal. I was the first pilot in my organization to become pregnant. And when I shared my news with my command, the reaction was not congratulations, it was that's it. No more female pilots. We'll talk more about that later. In most cases, women don't experience overt discrimination because they're mothers, but they're subtle to other, more subtle biases. Often people's perceptions of women change when they become mothers. After they become mothers, women may be overlooked for opportunities such as travel to professional conferences, or participation in field work or training. It can go like this. Oh, I didn't think you would want to go to that conference because you would have to be away from home. Sometimes these biases are well-intentioned, but they do not serve women professionally. Gender bias manifests itself in other ways. An example is a woman sharing an idea in a meeting and it not being responded to, but when a man shares the same idea, it receives great accolades. Gender bias can also impact females in a male-dominated field if they don't have the same hobbies or work with their men outside of the work environment. As a pilot, my colleagues and I called this the old boys club. These biases can be another leak in the pipeline. Additionally, these biases can lead to pay and advancement disparities. We've already talked about the lower numbers of women in leadership roles. Gender bias contributes to that. There's also a significant pay gap in STEM. According to the National Science Foundation, in 2018, women working full-time whose highest degree was at the bachelor's level earned 30% less than their male colleagues with the same level of experience. This is significant and another leak in the pipeline. We're almost ready to talk about solutions, but first I wanna talk about what I consider to be the biggest challenge to women in STEM. It's your problem. Many of the challenges women face are the woman's problem to solve. A lot of wonderful change has occurred in the workplace for women in the STEM fields, and there are some laws to protect women. However, when dealing with gender bias or sexual harassment, there are frequently significant professional disadvantages to women if they raise these issues. I'll give you some examples. My fieldwork experience in New Zealand, where I truly had no means of communication and was trapped, pulling out would have meant failing my research project and a significant part of my degree. Or, when I shared the news with my command about my pregnancy and the response was they shouldn't hire female pilots anymore. I was the very first female pilot in my organization to have a baby. If I spoke up, everyone would have known it was me. I loved my job and wanted to be successful. I did not want to be navigating a potential lawsuit that would permanently impact my ability to work with the team. 
I wanted to be focused on becoming a mom. There are many factors women have to consider any time one of these obstacles are thrown in their path. How do you respond in a way that you feel is appropriate without doing more damage? It's a delicate dance where you have to factor in power and politics and strategy. Here's one last example with a twist. One time at sea, the chief engineer repeatedly made inappropriate comments to me about my body. I went to the commanding officer, a female, for help. She basically made it clear that the problem was mine to solve. She said, tell him it's inappropriate. It didn't feel good to get that response, but her advice later played out in the airplane hangar, where we had a staff member who repeatedly made inappropriate comments to me and my female colleagues. After I realized this was impacting others, I planned ahead and I delivered my response to this individual. He was so taken aback and frightened that he never made another inappropriate comment to me or my colleagues. That moment was impactful for me too because I realized I had the power to influence behavior that can then save others from going through the same thing. And that is one of the ways that we can begin to address these problems. Here's another. Training. One of the first and most important things we can do is educate women and men about the challenges that they may face in the field and in the workplace. The Fieldwork Initiative that I mentioned earlier provides training about the realities of fieldwork, including tools and conversations before people go into the field. This prepares them to respond if better if a situation arises. Bystander intervention training is also important in raising awareness and giving people tools to address gender and diversity challenges. Helping people to be able to speak up in a situation where it's their problem can be extremely powerful, as I just shared. Helping people to be able to speak up when they're in a situation where it's somebody else's problem can be just as powerful. The act of speaking up also sets an example that makes it easier for others to follow. Within institutions, it is important to establish cultural norms around behaviors that are desired. Professionalism, respect, a psychologically safe environment. It's also important to have a variety of means of communicating when something's not right. Having an anonymous means of reporting can lead to greater transparency. Providing resources to help victims is also important. This can range from establishing a helpline to an employee assistance center with access to mental health professionals. Next, it is extremely important to provide positive early career experience to students and young professionals. This is what I'm really, really passionate about. Many women drop out of STEM if they have a negative experience, especially if it occurs early in their career. I work within my organization and with my fellow Woods Hole Science Institutions to support paid undergraduate internship programs that target diversity. These programs emphasize training for the mentors of the students to help them have a positive experience, and they provide the students with real substantial research. And almost universally, these result in a positive experience for the students. With over 200 graduates from these programs, over 80% of whom are minorities underrepresented in STEM, we have the tremendous success of having over 70% go on to careers in science, and over 20% go on to get PhDs. So this internship model is really powerful. It can be implemented in other places and can be used to help change the face of women and minorities in STEM. Another critical aspect of keeping women in science is having a network of people to provide support. I'm talking about both traditional networking and formal mentoring. For me, I had a trusted friend who entered the workforce at the same time as me and was by my side for 20 years. Women need examples at all levels that they can look to for advice and support, both men and women. It is also possible to be a mentor at any level. So if you don't know who your mentor is, you don't have one. If you don't know who you're mentoring, you're not doing it. If you're not doing it, do it. 
Make those connections and pass it on. Another way to help retain women is to form programs to provide support. In my workplace, we established a number of different employee resource groups. I'm the sponsor for the women's group. This group provides a means for networking through formal activities and informal coffee breaks. It helps women connect, establish relationships, they can share their struggles, and support one another. We have another program in my workplace that I helped establish, the Nursing Mothers Program. This program provides additional resources to women in the challenging position of returning to work while continuing to breastfeed their babies. I can speak firsthand about the challenges of traveling and conducting field work while breastfeeding. The Nursing Mothers Program provides many resources to moms, including dedicated lactation rooms and access to pumps. We have a lactation consultant that they can call. And uh, it most importantly provides a network of fellow moms that they can reach out to for support. Finally, it is essential to dig into these problems. As my diversity, equity, and inclusion colleague says to me, if this work were easy, it would be done by now. This work is not easy, and it's never done. It takes dedicated effort at all levels of the organization to address these challenges. It is especially important to have leadership buy-in. Leaders need to acknowledge that there is a problem and need to be outspoken about their support for all aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm extremely fortunate that that type of support exists in my current workplace. One thing that worked especially well in my organization was hosting listening sessions. We had one on gender bias, and it was really eye-opening. And from what we learned, we were able to implement things to directly address some of the concerns that came up. Hiring a diversity officer is also really important. It sends a powerful message, and it brings a professional to the table to make sure things get done. We also have teams in my workplace of staff who volunteer to work on diversity, equity, and inclusion topics. A lot of institutions tend to rely just on this goodwill of staff, but making prog progress in this arena requires more work than just a collateral duty. It requires dedication and effort. It requires a team. We have made so much progress over the course of my 20-year career. There are so many more opportunities for women so many more examples of women leaders, so many more tools that we have in our toolbox. I can't wait to see what the next 20 years will bring. Thank you. <laughs>